Dear all, welcome to one more Anamet Library Talk, a joint organization of the Anamet Library and Tarikh Vakfe, the History Foundation. I'm Vasya Mole, the head librarian of Anamet Library. Today, we are very happy to present to you the Byzantine Musical Instruments Research Project, the result of a collaboration among GABAM, the Kotsch University Stavros Miarchos Foundation Center for Late Antique and Byzantine Studies, the Friends of Music Society in Athens, and Kotsch University Sunekirats Library. The extensive investigation on primary and secondary resources revealed figures of musicians and musical instruments on artifacts such as caskets, wall paintings, mosaics, wooden icons, and more, but also on illuminations preserved inside Greek manuscripts dated between the 2nd and the 16th century. All these depictions, amounted to more than 400 visual representations, are now hosted in Tsuna Kirat's digital collections. To present the different stages of the project, we are hosting Antonios Botonakis, Alexandros Harkiolakis, Merve Oskilits, and Sene Mazar. Antonios Botonakis was the main postdoctorate researcher. He's received, uh, he received his PhD from the University of Athens, the Department of Music Studies, and he has studied both Byzantine and Western music. He's currently teaching at the Hellenic Mediterranean University at the Department of Music Technology uh, and Acoustics, and his main research areas include Byzantine and research music theory and practice, organology and, edu and educational informatics. Alexandros Karkiolakis studied mu uh, music at the Hellenic Conservatoire and at the University of Sheffield. He has worked as a musicologist and coordination for educational project in the Music Library of Greece, Lillian Guduri, and he's now serving as the director of the Friends of Music Society in Greece. He has edited and written several books on music-related topics. Merve Oskilits received her bachelor's degree in archaeology from Imarsinan University of Fine Arts and her master's degree from the Department of History of Architecture from the Istanbul Technical University. She is currently a PhD student in History of Architecture at Istanbul Technical University, and she is also working as a project coordinator at Kabam for the Istanbul City Walls Project. Senem Adjar completed two master's degrees in musicology from Duke University and in the field of library and information science from North Carolina University. She's our colleague at uh, Sunekirat's library, working as an archive specialist and data curator in various projects. She's also the editor of the recent second volume of the Coach University Manuscripts Catalog. Before we start, I would like to mention that your microphones and cameras have been turned off and the session is being recorded. You are very welcome to ask your questions using the chat option, and the speaker will reply to you once they finish their talk. Enjoy the talk. Now, well, thank you very much for your nice introduction, Wasia. Uh, so, as uh, Wasia mentioned, today we have come together to talk about the Byzantine Musical Instruments project and how this project evolved from the beginning till the end. So during the talk, our speakers will focus their contribution, uh, discuss their contribution to the project and their overall takes. So, but prior to that, uh, I will make a short introduction. Uh, this project was realized in 2018 with funds from uh, Stavros Narcos Foundation Center for Late Antique and Byzantine Studies, Gabam at Koch University. And it was completed last year. Um, this digital collection was an end product of collaboration between the Friends of Music Society in Athens and Gabam. So at this point, perhaps I should mention the project participants. Uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Engin Akurek at Gabam Koch University was the project director. Uh, Professor Dr. Nikos Maliaras was a scientific supervisor. The research was conducted by Dr. Antonis Botonokis. Uh, project coordinators were uh, Dr. Uh, Alexandros Harkiliokis from the Friends of Music Society and Boris Altan from Gabam. Uh, content editor and uh, Turkish translator was Merve Özkılıç. Uh, technical support was provided by Yorgos Bompos and Vera Kriyesi from Friends of Music Society and Suna Kratch Library Crew. So, uh, first, we'll start by Alexandros about how the project was conceived and um, how the collaboration has gone so far. Uh, about the research aspect of the project, we will leave the floor to Antonis. 
And following that, uh, we'll have an open discussion about the status of the project and contributions by the participants. And uh, later, I will discuss the library's role. And finally, we'll end the talk with the Q&A section. So um, now, without further ado, um, I would like to leave the stage to our speakers first to uh, Alexandros. Thank you very much, Sanem. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Vasiliki, for uh, the previous introduction. Dear friends, uh, it's, a, it's a great privilege and honor to be with you today. Um, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've spent four and a half years of my life in Istanbul uh, teaching at uh, MIAM and um, being the head of the library there, the music library. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it, it, I always followed the Anamed talks and I always wanted to be, um, you know, uh, invited to give one, but it never happened. I gave other talks in other institutions, but my topics, because I work mostly on Western music, um, they, they, they didn't match uh, Anamed. However, now that I have left Istanbul uh, now since uh, 2017, I have the privilege to be invited. So thank you very much to all the people from Anamed uh, for inviting me. Uh, before I start, um, I would just want to um, uh, pass on the, uh, uh, the greetings of uh, Professor um, Nikos Maliaras, who cannot be with us today um, uh, because he has prior engagements, but he's uh, sending his uh, greetings and love to all the academic community in Istanbul and everywhere in the world where um, they are uh, uh, listening and uh, watching us. So <clears throat> I will start by just a very brief introduction about who, uh, who is the Friends of Music Society, just for you to know what kind, probably most of you know, of course, what Gabam is, what, of course, what Kotsch University is, and of course, what the Sunakirats uh, Great Library is. Um, I just want to say a few things about the Friends of Music. The Friends of Music is a, is an, is a society, is a music society that is the founding father of the Athens Concert Hall. It has been established almost um, 70 years ago in 1953. And um, apart from um, um, establishing the Athens Concert Hall, if you've ever been to Athens, probably you know what I'm talking about, Megaron. Um, we have also established the Music Library of Greece, among other things. Music Library of Greece it has a vast collection. It is, of course, the biggest music library um, in, in, in Greece, but also probably the biggest music library in the periphery of, uh, of the Mediterranean periphery. Um, there, uh, we preserve and we're trying with our great colleagues, um, we're, we're trying to, to preserve any type of musical heritage of the area and of course the um, one one of the one of the topics that we're interested in is byzantine music uh, as a matter of fact our the director of our library mrs stephanie miracles is uh, is an expert on uh, byzantine music um, so we have a special interest in it um, so let me just uh, start by uh, tell you a little story of how this project came to be. Um, I have been uh, quite familiar with um, with a book that Nikos Mayaras wrote a few years ago, and it is actually the outcome of his research, of his of his earlier research uh, in in Munich um, when he was uh, studying for his PhD uh, back then. So this uh, his PhD turned into a book a few years ago. And uh, among other things that he has written in his life, mostly on Western music. Um, and this book actually was on Byzantine musical instruments. It is a topic that not many uh, researchers around the world, uh, you see here on your right, the, 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 the cover of the book, um, but they haven't, um, um, they haven't touched upon that much. I think that Nikos is uh, probably a world expert on the topic. And I think that now Adonis is a world expert on the topic. Uh, so um, having this in mind, um, 
I was always thinking that this would be a great research project to whom would be uh, interested to be involved. And of course, when uh, we had one meeting with uh, Professor Ingin Akirek uh, in Istanbul some time ago, I think it was late 2017 or something, just a few, a few months before, before we launched this project, um, he became very interested, of course, He's a, he's, a, he's a Byzantinologist of world renown, so he would be. Therefore, um, we started collaborating by uh, putting our expertise, which is music, um, and uh, adding it to the great expertise that Gabam has in order to form uh, a coalition, in order to um, uh, bring into life and actually focus and give, you know, set some light on a topic that not that many people knew. Um, the, um, the research, the, 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 the project evolved uh, multifold because in a sense, it is not only a project that has to do with Byzantine music. Many people can see it also as a great repository project, like a digital humanities project. These are aspects that we probably will see later. Uh, we embarked on a, on a research phase in the, in the project that Adonis will talk about in a bit. Um, and we embarked on it in order to um, uh, reveal as many uh, as possible of um, those uh, little pictures, actually, uh, of Byzantine instruments that we could find around. Either these are being digitized in other very far away uh, institutions, but also he embarked on a research in Istanbul and on uh, material in Istanbul and then in Greece. Uh, when we managed to compile all that, uh, we decided that this needs to be visible to the people. So that's why, with the great help of the people at uh, Sunakiras Library, we found ways in order for this to be um, uh, added to their repository and now be uh, uh, easy to uh, research on and also to visit uh, through their website. Uh, the, 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 uh, the project, as you will see later, I'm just giving an overview. Uh, it, uh, it included, apart from the repository, which is available to anyone uh, around the world to research and, um, uh, and see, it, invo it involved um, the, um, a digital exhibition that, will be, um, that, that was formed and we're going to talk about in a bit. And um, 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 some presentations that you see, of course, COVID, has uh, stopped us from uh, being able to present it as we would like to, but this is, an, this is a project that it is still uh, uh, alive and it's still going on. We do not expect more to be induced into it, but there is a lot there to discuss about, and uh, I'm sure that we'll find opportunities to present it to the world and that people will be writing about it. I think I'm going to stop here. And I'm going to pass the torch to the to the next speaker because uh, I think that uh, he will have a lot to say about the project. Thank you very much for now, and I'm here. If you need any questions, thank you very much, dear Alexandros. Thank you, Basque, for the invitation. Thank you, Sanem, for the introduction. Thank you all for being here for showing great interest in. Uh, Byzantine musical tradition, Byzantine musical instruments. Uh, I shall continue the story from where Alexandros left off. It was March 2018, if I'm not, if I remember correctly, when we first met online, we had this introduction and in this interview and later on late October, the same year, 2018, I came to Istanbul full of hope, full of energy to do my best I'm a both a musicologist, I'm a both musician, I play lots of musical instruments. Uh, it is an area which is uh, really exciting for me. Uh, of course, let's not forget to mention 
um, Mr. Professor Mayara's book that, is, that Alexander has already referred to. The book, if I'm not mistaken, was published, the first publication was in 2007, and the second one in 2011, if I remember correctly. So Professor Mayaras, apart from the supervision, he also gathered a vast uh, folder of artifacts, of images, which he gladly shared with us, uh, with me as the postdoc researcher, with Gabam, with everyone, so as to get a starting point for the research. Uh, from there on, we had many things to take into account. Uh, several years have passed since Professor Mayara's book. We had to consult up-to-date bibliography. We had to consult the research, scientific articles, uh, revise all of the information already provided to us. So uh, it is safe to say that this research was based on more than 3,000 up-to-date books, several catalogs, several scientific articles from all over the world. Um, the institutes, we have uh, many institutes that we had to get in contact with because I can understand artifacts move around from museum to museum. Perhaps there are new exhibitions, uh, new catalogs are published. Uh, every year, and we had to be up to date with that current bibliography. So we contacted the museums, the institutes, the libraries. Uh, we had to consult also churches, uh, monasteries, uh, and many other institutions. So uh, as um, Basque said in the beginning, uh, we have more than 400 visual representations from the wider geographical area of the Byzantine Empire, uh, beginning from the late second century up to the 16th century. Uh, many of the artifacts are preserved inside manuscripts, there are illuminations, uh, starting from the seventh century, if not mistaken. Uh, we have various artifacts that can be found traced on frescoes, on wooden icons, on uh, luxury items, and so on. Uh, if we can continue to the next slide. In the beginning, we mentioned uh, about more than 130 countries inside. The top nine countries that house artifacts that were used and embodied in the Byzantine Musical Instruments Digital Database come from Greece, the Vatican, Italy, Russia, France, the United Kingdom, Israel, Turkey, and Cyprus. Most of these artifacts are categorized as illumination and manuscripts. And you can see in this slide that almost half of them can be traced inside uh, illuminations of Greek manuscripts. Uh, two, 231 are miniatures, uh, 55 are wall paintings or frescoes inside churches. Uh, 34 are vessels, tableware. In this category, we should place uh, pots, we should place plates uh, or everyday items. We have mosaics uh, found both in late Roman villas, uh, but still in existence today, since the archaeological, uh, this archaeological that is, is going on, this research provides us with more and more artifacts. We have wooden icons, caskets, plaques, Pixies, musical instruments like trumpets, actually, uh, sorry, like avlos, flute, uh, sistrum, or, or olifants, uh, ostotech, reliefs, figurine fragments, freeze fragments. We have come across with one game device and one uh, miniature of Orpheus, who what is served as a table support. Uh, 405 artifacts in total, with the miniatures being the first in our list. Now let's move on to some other categories that classify the, the classification of musical instruments. Uh, first of all, let's explain what aerophone means, even though I'm pretty sure that everyone knows. Aerophone comes from the Greek word air, meaning air. And this category refers to the instruments that are played by a vibrating mass of air that is contained inside the instruments. The chordophones uh, refers to the musical instruments that use strings to make sound. 
the idea of phones uh, is a instrument comprising of a resonant material such as metal, wood, stone that vibrates to produce stone. And the membrane of phones uh, derives from the Greek word membrane and phony, meaning the instruments that use uh, one or two stretched membranes that when hit, create great sound. From uh, our research, we found out that the most referred to uh, musical instrument uh, is probably the trumpet, which appears in the aerophone category. You can see that the aerophones is almost half of the depictions, the chordophones about one third. The idiophones take about 10% of the whole uh, categories and less than 9% because it comes to the membrane of phones. In total, we have 635 different depictions of instruments, which are shown either as a unity, one by one, or a group of more than one musical instrument, depending on the artifact and on the context of the illumination. Here, we decided to share with you some images and let me start by saying that uh, the categories that our artifacts fall into have to do mostly with Christianity or Christianical themes. Almost half of them are in this category. We have mythological depictions, which is about 15%, daily life scenes, about 30%, some war scenes, 5%, and some images where we have an individual depiction of a musician without any reference to any text or no reason, just for decorative purposes. On the top left part, you can see an illumination from uh, the Parisian's Grecus manuscript 135, folio 150 verso. Uh, in brief, this, is, this manuscript was compiled by Manuel Cicandilis back in 1362. Uh, it, it comes from the book of Job in uh, chapter 21, verse 12. The author says that people sing to the music of timbre and lyre, and they make merry to the sound of the pipe. Of course, here we cannot see something like that. We can see that the three figures uh, are playing a rectangular psaltery, a short necked lute, and a trapezoidal psaltery which brings us to the next issue that most of the times the painter or the artist uh, tried to keep a unity between the text and what was appeared, but many times they have freedom of their own. They, the poet writes the word lyre and they paint something that it looks like a lyre, but it perhaps it has some other shape or more or less strings. So we're trying to find the average way of uh, introducing instruments, different way of categorizing instruments. Uh, of course, you can visit uh, our uh, this uh, database uh, on our collection. You can visit some sites, uh, the ones that uh, uh, shared with all of us. Let's go now to the bottom left part. This illumination comes from the Vatican, Greco 699, uh, Folio 60, 63 Verso. This manuscript is dated to the ninth century. You can see King David in the middle, holding a rectangular psaltery and Solomon on his side. In the middle, uh, the illumination that takes most of this slide is taken from the Pandeleimonos Monastery in Mount Athos, uh, it dated in the 12th century, and it shows the birth of Zeus and the worship of Rhea at the same time. This mythological, according to the mythology, uh, Rhea saved uh, Zeus when he was uh, he had birth due to Cronus who looked for him. So we can see some very interesting. Uh, we can make some very interesting remarks based on that elimination, such as we see uh, the Curites who are playing musical instruments so as to cover young Zeus' uh, cry. You can see on the top left part uh, double a double membrane drum playing with the sticks, a pair of cymbals, a transverse flute, and on the bottom part, Rhea and some other musicians playing the same instruments, a double skin barrel drum and a pair of cymbals. On the top right part, we can see a fresco, a fresco from the church of Aios Georgios in Murne, Rethymno, 
dated between 2018 and 1320. Uh, this depiction is based on the large judgment uh, foundation dogma, which says that on the second judgment, all souls will be judged according to their actions. On one part, we can read of the Revelation, chapter 12, the verse 13, we read that, and the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and hell gave up their dead that were in them. So we can imagine that the female figure sitting on the, on the creature at the middle of the fresco is giving away the dead ones that were had an accident on the sea, most perhaps, so as to be judged. And we can see the angel on the top right corner playing, blowing his trumpet that announces the judgment day. On the bottom right part uh, is another fresco from the church of Timo Stavros of Ayasmati, that's in Platanistasa in Cyprus. Uh, this fresco is dated in 1494. It shows the nativity scene. According to the nativity scene, we can uh, see Virgin Mary on the middle with the ox and the ass next to her. The adoration of the Magi of the three wizards coming on the top part, the angel announcing the good news, the birth of Jesus. And on the bottom left part, we can see a figure, a shepherd who is holding a flute. Shepherds uh, shared the good news that the angels and the archangels gave to them, provided to them, so as to spread the good news all around the world. This is a common uh, practice. We see this nativity seen many times in our artifacts, and they all more or less show the same. Sometimes the three magi, the three wise men are not there, or the shepherds change places. But in general, the depiction and the thematic is the same. Uh, in the next slide, we will see on the top left part a terracotta plate from Rhodes. This plate is located inside the palace of the Grand Master of the Knights, and it is dated on the, to the late 12th century. Here we can see a person, a figure in the middle holding a rectangular psaltery. The psaltery, as you can see, has many strings. Uh, here's a dynamical shape from where we can tune in the instrument in several notes, several tones. And the person in the black, in black next to him is a dancer. Is a dancer, dancers in that area were illustrated with long floppy sleeves which covered their hands. Uh, on the top, on the bottom left part, we can see a part of the Cyprus Plates Museum. This Artifact is located inside the Cyprus Museum in the Antiquities Department of Cyprus, dated to the first quarter of the seventh century. King David is shown on the right part. Uh, the plate is titled The Summoning of David. In the middle part, we can see a picture. This picture came, comes from, is preserved, sorry, in the Kremlin Museum in Moscow, and it is dated between 380 and 420. AD. It shows the muses, the nine muses, which are great importance. They are symbols of antiquity, late antiquity, and somehow found their way in early Christian society. Uh, the muses that uh, are of importance to us is Efterpi, the muse of lyric poetry, which you cannot see. It's on the other part of the picture that holds long flutes. Terpsichori, that plays a guitar and Polymnia, that you can see here in the middle, holding a lyre. Uh, Polymnia in Greek mythology was the muse of sacred poetry, sacred hymn, dance, and agriculture and pantomime. On the top right part, we can see a mosaic from the Great Palace in Istanbul, dated in the seventh century. The mosaic generally depicts daily life scene. We can see some farmers and the person who, who is on feeders to our research can be located in the top right part that holds a short net loot. Finally, on the bottom right part, we can see an ivory pixies from Xanthen Museum in Germany dated to the fifth century. Uh, pixies in general were used as boxes to keep things inside, such as cosmetics. Uh, the person in the middle is blowing 
something that it maybe looks like a trumpet, but due to its diagonal shape, uh, is the identified as a natural horn, a natural horn made of large sea snails' cones. This instrument is in Greek referred to as kochlos. The air was blown into the instrument through an opening uh, by removing the final spirals of the shells. Uh, due to the lack of sound holes, the musician was able to create one or more sound of different pitch by adjusting the pressure of his lips against the seashell. All of the images that we shared with you had to show at first the great variety of artifacts. We can see that we have uh, miniatures, we have plates, we have pictures, uh, we have daily life objects like pixies, we have mosaics, we have wooden icons. And most of the time the context is mainly, of course, has to do with Christianity, but we can see images that serve as decorative patterns or, or some other use. It's not entirely Christian, but the majority of them is. Uh, right now, I would like to go to the next slide and perhaps talk with uh, Senem and Merve about the database formation. Yeah, actually, um... I would like to mention a little bit details about the uh, database formation and what roles we played as library uh, in my part. Uh, maybe Merve can uh, intervene here. Uh, we can invite Merve to talk about Gabam's part, uh, content editing after you uh, prepared the um, database and uh, metadata descriptions, um, translation parts. So maybe she can a little uh, share some uh, experience about the project. Thank you, Sanam. Uh, first of all, I would like to explain what content editor means in this context. It's mostly to homogenize the data set we have at hand. So the users of the database can filter them in a uniform way and they will be able to see for example we have highlighted uh, here the instrument historical period instrument types provenance and type of object are the filters that are now visible on the snowcratch library's website and we have further tried to uh, for example type of material we have tried to unify them as well and this is mostly to, you know, uh, to create a functional database creation, but also to enable further addition of materials. As most of you know who are attending this talk, there should be a lot of material in Turkish and Greek museums that are not published and also excavation material. So this is something that we hope would enable other researchers to build upon and we can enlarge this database. And I will leave the technical aspects of it to Senam Hajar. Thank you very much. So um, if I mention a little bit about uh, our participation and maybe I should start by giving a little bit background information regarding our collaborative uh, collections and projects. Uh, as a library, we've always open, uh, we've always been open to student projects and projects of other uh, academic units. Uh, we see these projects uh, enriching valuable additions to our existing archival collections. So one of the projects is a soundscape uh, project, which was created by uh, our former doctoral student, Pnar Cevikayakiani. The other one is the Echoes of Industrial Legacy Collection, uh, a project by one of our graduate students, Honor Engin. Uh, in addition to our student projects, we also include the projects of academic departments, especially those of the College of uh, Social Sciences and Humanities make up a good portion of them, such as archaeology and history of the uh, art department and media and visual arts department. Uh, the first of these projects uh, started in 2017 uh, with uh, Lucien Shenojak on oral history studies from the history department. And later other projects started to follow this. 
Uh, we recently opened a collection of photographs taken during field work carried out by archaeologist department students. The work of similar collections is also ongoing. So what do we do while uh, acquiring collections, new collections? The mission undertaken by the library directorate at Koch University is to preserve, maintain, provide open access to archives and cultural heritage collections, and ultimately uh, to transfer this knowledge to future generations. Uh, as a matter of fact, digitization also plays an important preservation role as surrogates protecting fragile and valuable originals from handling while presenting their content to a vastly increased audience. Digital collections are also open to global access to a wider audience. Although digitization seems like a very easy and practical method, with all technological devices, it actually brings some more uh, very complex problems with it. The most important of these is the cost. Uh, professional digitization tools, equipment, as well as elements such as hardware and software to operate these devices, even the digitization process is very expansive in uh, its own right. So apart from this archiving and backing up the files we digitized, the constant updating of file versions requires separate management and planning with um, extensive IT support. Another element of digital initiatives is the competence of the digital data management system. Of course, there are some factors that determine the competence of such a system. It must have features such as in the user interface, enabling boiling searches, uh, being an open system that is being searchable and integrated into search engines such as Google or worldcats.org. In the backend interface of the data management system, some features for the good data management can be counted as allowing collective changes and corrections, batch processing, exporting and importing, keeping user statistics and meeting international metadata standards. In addition, it should adequately represent descriptive, structural and administrative metadata. After providing all these technical infrastructures and services, there's a need for qualified people who will do the scanning and retouching processes, such as media specialists, graphicers, or someone understanding the taxonomy and uh, content of the archival materials to create data, produce value added information by searching on the materials in depth. Um, we produce metadata schema uh, suitable for the content and needs of each collection, depending, depending on the subject matter. For instance, in the field of archaeology, history, music, ethnography, or anthropology, we can customize the schema as we did with this project. Of course, when making metadata descriptions, archivists do the necessary research, but we also get support from subject matter experts if the collections are on subjects outside of our field of expertise. Understanding the content of the materials is critical to make meaningful connections among the materials, so as to make uh, the database more useful for researchers. This happens through keywords, linked data, subject headings, and relational taxonomies based on the content of information, as uh, you can see in this, on this uh, database. So when you, a digital collection is created, besides all these technical and technological infrastructures and descriptions developed by experts, we also receive legal support for copyrights and licenses. Um, digital publishing, though still a very new topic, has become a, an increasingly widespread practice in Turkey. Uh, digital collections are also seen in the field of digital publishing and are evaluated within the framework of the law on uh, intellectual and artistic works. One of the main criteria we consider when acquiring a collection is whether its items have copyright issues or not. 
we prefer not to acquire the collection if there are any doubts about that. If the copyright belongs to the collection owners, then a protocol is signed between the library and collection owners. In this case, the terms of use by third parties are determined by the collection owners. If copyrights include patents or any commercial concerns, then we don't, the donor may impose uh, a usage restriction. Yet, with such exceptions, I can say that typically all of our collections are fully accessible. So um, another factor we pay attention to while acquiring a collection is the fact that collection materials should be unique and rare that are not easily available anywhere else or not. Whether it has original content as a project idea, whether it has a scientific value, whether it can serve as original research material or as primary source for the user. So be it a student project, a personal collection or a research project, similar evaluations are made by the library management while adding new collections. So uh, as for this project, it was our second collection uh, with Gabam after the Byzantine Monuments Photograph Archive. Uh, from uh, 2015. This present collection was brought to us as a project proposal in 2018 by Barish Alpan. Uh, the purpose was to present uh, the research output in a digital collection and to make all the data related to the images searchable on a database. As a library, we provided technical infrastructure and technical support. Uh, after the initial administrative correspondence with Gabam, we had the opportunity to work with Antonis uh, and the Friends of Music Society in the research management of the study and on music related issues. And uh, the most important feature of this project is that uh, it's one of the rare databases in this field. Uh, if you consider the extensive literature on vocal and religious aspects of uh, Byzantine music, we see that there is little research on instrumental music tradition uh, and instruments in this field. Uh, the most important factor uh, in this matter is perhaps the fact that the primary sources are spread over a very dispersed uh, geography, which requires all of them to be identified like identified like a detective. Uh, as far as I'm aware, primary source work, especially in the field of organology, is very rare in Byzantine music. So in this respect, it's a pioneering study to include all instrument families, categories in a searchable database according to organological classification. Additionally, uh, this project is presented in as a multilingual database. In other words, we aim that the database should be intellectually accessible in Greek, Turkish, and English. Uh, so my contribution on my behalf was to make the necessary guidelines for the proper and efficient description provided by the metadata schema. I worked on the aspects such as what would contribute to its searchability and indexing as someone from the music history background. So we worked on the development of, on a database by considering uh, research habits uh, of a music researcher. We worked on, on this jointly after which the database of this project was created. Um, for me, the most challenging part of this project was about the copyrights and license permissions. While iconographic images were collected from the relevant uh, institutions from different countries, some license permits were not obtained, whereas some images conditions of permissions were very obscure. Uh, therefore, after the project was completed, Antonis brought together all the permission documents uh, collected from the housing institutions. Then I prepared a chart according to the permission status of the visuals. So I determined true permission, three uh, permission categories according to their conditions. Uh, the first type of status was fully, op fully open for use. The second type of status was those that don't allow the, to use under some conditions which uncertain terms of use. And uh, the, finally, the third type of status was one that doesn't allow to use at all. So as you can see, uh, some of the images are not seen uh, for the users. They have only metadata uh, 
information, uh, bibliographic uh, information, citation, citations, uh, others uh, with the permissions have the images uh, and fully accessible. If you can click on the uh, restricted files, Mare. Thank you. You can see the metadata uh, details here. Uh, and also you can uh, click the link to the housing institutes and then you can see the original image uh, on the uh, website of the uh, institute itself here. Yeah. So all I can say uh, about uh, libraries part uh, in this project. So maybe we can move to an open uh, discussion about uh, about your takes, your opinions about the project. So what was the most challenging part of the project, for instance, for you? <laughs> Yeah, Alexandros. Thank you very much. Um, I think, first of all, coming from a, from a, um, uh, also a library uh, uh, background myself. I mean, I have uh, I have been heading the Eero Lucha Music Library for four and a half years, and before that, I was working at the Music Library of Greece. Um, so, I have, if this is a state of the art work, uh, a state of the art work on your behalf at the Sunakirats library, especially on the metadata level, because they are, um, they are very uh, attentive. And this, is, this was uh, very interesting uh, uh, to, to, to see and observe how, how, how uh, you know, went into the detail of it. Basically, the idea of the database was to bring all these, no matter if we had direct access to the, to the image or not, bring them under a new, let's say shell um so the shell was this great database that you have uh, built uh at uh, sunakirat library and people can find compiled uh, a lot of information about instruments that they couldn't find scattered around so apart from being able to do that uh, by giving all this information through metadata you made them so much available image or not image. I mean, you can, it's just one click away, basically, the image for those who want to, to do their research. And I think that uh, this is this is a very good example of, um, uh, of, of good librarianship work. Uh, well done. That's what I want to say. Uh, probably we, you would like to discuss a bit about the digital exhibition and the um, uh, proposed um, uh, discussion with uh, with uh, Redeem, but this can come in the, on a later stage. Um, you, you you have the you have the baton, the conductor's baton, uh, Senem. So just guide us through. Uh, so yeah, um, actually, I just want to make you feel free uh, about uh, your you know, uh, speech. Please feel free uh, to join anytime. So uh, yeah, also. Uh, what I noticed about the other institutions, when you know, click and search make, uh, on the websites uh, or uh, Google uh, search engines, you can find them. So they are not findable. But uh, the system we use is the OCLC, WorldCat OCLC. That's why uh, it's uh, findable, retrievable on the any web uh, search engine. Um, I think I, I find it very effective uh, so that um, the success of a database or digital collection is defined by its searchability anywhere. So uh, other uh, systems are uh, prior priority or closed systems, not open systems, not op open source systems. Uh, that's why uh, they are not searchable outside of their own uh, website or system. Uh, so yeah, um, initially uh, one of the byproducts uh, was uh, planned to be the Google Arts and uh, 
uh, culture exhibition, but uh, unfortunately it did, wasn't realized uh, due to the red tape with the uh, guys from Google. Uh, it was a long <laughs> process. Uh, that's why uh, you, I guess, shift from Google to Europeana. And uh, it was prepared by Merve and uh, Antonis. So uh, I guess uh, it was an example of good creation of uh, all, all the 400 something uh, materials. And uh, it was presented in a, a good context or in a, a very a nice uh, context. Uh, I think uh, for Europeana exhibition, it's exhibitions, um, it's a little unusual, the construction of the uh, exhibition because um, you your categorizations uh, in according to organological practices uh, are also accepted uh, by the European guys, I guess. Uh, so how did this process uh, go? Uh, maybe you can give some details about the European how open uh, are they um, maybe for other collection owners? Uh, it might be uh, inspiring to share. Antonis or Merve? <laughs> I would like to say in, in exhibitions, it's it should be simple and not oriented to the scholarly audience. So we have tried to simplify the knowledge we have gathered from the database with Antonios, and we have tried to give a brief summary of the results of this research because it's not either way. Uh, with the database, you have limited uh, amount of area to inform the audience. This way, you can see it as a whole and guide your audience through the database with these categories we have taught. And we have mainly built uh, these categories to guide the database users. And the first one is iconography because the database is built upon the iconography of the musical instruments, mm -hmm. uh, which will be further explained in the upcoming, upcoming book by Gabam. And Antonis Botanakis will be writing on the iconography of Byzantine musical instruments along with professors Nikos Maliaras and Christian Trollskart. They will uh, prepare this book. And then the second part of the exhibition, we made it context because uh, the images provide an explanation of the context the instruments were used and where do we see the Byzantine instruments and how often they appear as a part of a specific scene, which like Antonius mentioned, mostly they're religious scenes, but even when they are religious, they are reflecting a day like, for example, Miriam celebrating their passing of the Red Sea is actually a celebration, even though it appears in a religious context. So we have tried to give a brief summary of this information. Then we, we move on to the instrument types as they appear most frequently to the least frequently, but they also happen to be alphabetical for our chance. So this was the main category of the ex exhibition and I will leave the floor to Antonius. Thank you. Thank you, Sunem. Uh, actually, just to add some things. Yes, we tried to make the Ecos of an Empire digital exhibition uh, as simple, but also informative at the same time. We tried to include and embody all type of artifacts that we could share with uh, the digital audience. All the images are uh, free of copyright uh, in fear of copyright, you can see the European wanted some certain dimensions which we preserved. Uh, what Merve said before is right. Uh, most of them are religious. Most of them, the artist, the miniature artist tries to follow the text at hand. So for instance, uh, we know that uh, in David's book of Psalms, it says, praise the Lord in Lear or symbols in Kithara. And we see that the artist is trying to personify this text into an image. Most of the time it's accurate, some other time it's not so accurate. So we have to have a comparative study between uh, the artifacts and evaluate their 
importance in terms of iconography. Here, uh, we tried to make a symbol, a plane, but full of images and full of worth, worth noting uh, information for our audience to share, to follow. And uh, as Mary said, yes, we're preparing a detailed uh, book in the next couple of months, the Byzantine Musical Instruments book in cooperation with Gabam and uh, Nikos Maliaras, whose name is already mentioned several times during our talk, the scientific supervisor of the Byzantine Musical Instruments project, and Christian Trozergaard from uh, Denver, from, from Copenhagen. And the book will also have a Byzantine instruments dictionary, which will have original drawings of each instrument, which is being drawn by the artist Ezgi Özbakkaloğlu and Onur Gürkan and Antonius Kutanakis has provided the definition. So in, in a sense, it also works in an arch, archaeological dictionary of instruments because most of them are rooted in much, much earlier times. So uh, will it gonna be, uh, be published on the uh, Koç University? Publish publications or which Obama publisher? University, Obama and Koç University. Will be okay. bilingual, one Turkish and one English. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we have also some users' data uh, when we consider the success of a database, uh, we need to look at the uh, page views, of course. So when you see the numbers, uh, what what's your take uh, about that? So what do you think? Uh, do you think it's a, a promising uh, project or disappointing? What, what's your imp impression about that? Alexandros? My opinion is it says there are more than 4,000 visitors have accessed the database since May 2019. And now we just heard about a new book on, on an aspect of it. So um, the word happy doesn't actually, you know, describe it. I'm thrilled actually about this kind of uh, success. Um, uh, the, this kind of um, archaeomusicology, some people ca call it, Sometimes it's it's a it's a discipline of musicology, uh, but also it touches upon other uh, musicological aspects apart from only the apart from the Byzantinologists and the archaeologists that they would be interested in it. I think I'm more than thrilled actually, and under these circumstances, uh, I'm more than thrilled to see that so many people have accessed it. So I think that it's a big success. But that's maybe me and my enthusiastic um, uh, approach to things. But I think that it's four thousand people, the you know, this, you know, looking at the at the at the at the database of Byzantine instruments. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, how about Antonis? Yes, if I may add, um, mm -hmm. I would like just to open any picture, any item, if you like, just to say uh, more things with an image, most probably. Uh, the, oh. So, uh, as you can see, uh, we began uh, on late October 2018 with 10 rows of metadata per image, and we reached the number of 26 columns per image, per artifact. Uh, we took into consideration, as I said in the beginning of this talk, all up-to-date bibliography because uh, some of them has inconsistencies, especially with manuscripts uh, regarding their position in the manuscript, if it is recto or verso or the century or the author of it. So we had to verify each artifact several times and justify uh, the author or the date uh, based on both the author when there is a name or the paper, if we could have an, uh, an image of it. And we use several ways to verify and consolidate our uh, results, the results of this project. On, as you will see, uh, towards scrolling down to the bottom, you will see that some rows are empty. These rows mostly have to do with the author, not every book, every manuscript is signed by a person, 
most of the uh, authors, describers, uh, were in general, this was their occupation. So they didn't have too much, info. we cannot have so much information. Um, it's good though that the metadata is, we tried to make it as complete as possible, as full as possible. We have uh, five filters based on the instrument itself, based on the historical period, which corresponds to the date of creation of the artifacts that we'll see. Instrument type, uh, meaning uh, aerophones, chordophones, idiophones, or bearable phones, provenance, where it is, was made. Perhaps it is not so clear that even though the majority of the artifacts was made in Constantinople, as a matter of fact, we have some other areas, as Trebizon, where the manuscript, uh, from the Skeletis manuscript, is, if I recall uh, correctly, is there. And the lastly, we have the type of object, because if you recall the previous slide, we have many type of objects from actual musical instrument to mosaics, to fresco, to icons, etc. Uh, as Alexander said a couple of minutes ago, we have several links where that was possible. Uh, most of the libraries do share their content online uh, just for educational purposes or research purposes. Where that was the case, we tried to paste these uh, these web links inside our database. Uh, where it is not, uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the chance to do so. And we had to Google all around uh, the internet. I asked them correctly said, not, it's not so clear to find an artifact. Most of the times, if it is in Russia, you have to search in, in uh, Russia language or something. If it is in Ita Italy, you have to use the italics and so on, Italian language. Uh, however, I, be I believe that what we have created is a thorough metadata uh, collection that uh, every researcher will find useful. And um, the century, where is it right now? Where is it from? If we could access this information, if it is available online and so on. I don't know if Merve has something to add. Only to, well, actually, I agree with you about the language, especially. Uh, so uh, if you make it in the original language, uh, it, it's OK that for the local audience, local searchers, but not for the global searchers. So I agree with that. Um, it's another aspect that's not uh, searchable uh, the, the, for the institutions you mentioned. Uh, so, uh, actually, from the musicological or ethnomusicological perspective, uh, to what extent you use you, you adopted the uh, horn bostel sax method to your classification? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Uh, the truth is that we chose not to go with on the Hornbostel sax classification, because even though we know how a flute looks like, or we know what a lira or a kithara or cymbals look like, it's very difficult based on small illumination, based on small drawings uh, inside manuscripts to determine the exact shape. We can, many of the times we cannot even see the sound holes just to be sure if it has five or six sound holes. We cannot make the exact number of strings if it is a chordophone. So we could not say that for cert with certainty that what we see could be classified to the Hornbosser sax category, to be sure as to where to place it, to be sure as to where to classify it. So that's why we chose the general uh, idea of showing us aerophones, chordophones, that not open read or double read or single read instruments because even the miniatures themselves are very difficult to be explained to say what we're seeing. Uh, to me it doesn't seem like that they have they had a standardized instrumental uh, making practices I guess do they <laughs> they had different types of different sizes maybe different uh, 
a variety of uh, instrument types, maybe the same instrument has different features, maybe? The first thing that we did regarding to manuscript was to read the text. The text, most of the times, mm -hmm. to the illumination. So as uh, we crossed the rivers of Babylon, uh, I can't recall the person right now, and we put our instruments into the branches of the trees. So we can we know that the instruments are supposed to be shown, but in most cases, not all the instruments are the same. We see psalteries, we see chordophones, we see avlos, we see trumpets, we see a lot of instruments. We know at which parts of the Book of Psalms instruments are supposed to be shown. And that is a good thing. The bad thing is that the painter or the artist most of the time didn't pay too much attention. Maybe he was not even a musician himself. He just wanted to show a musical instrument, which he portrayed, but with no much detail, because that mm. would be a musicologist, most probably, or excessive knowledge on instruments. So you mean that uh, to get an accurate, accurate uh, portrayal of the instrument, you need to read the text and the depictions are not as accurate as the text themselves then? We can come to that conclusion maybe. Uh, exactly. Uh, in, in the book of Psalms, we read that let's praise the Lord with the sounding of the trumpet. So we know from late antiquity that the trumpet in the Roman years was a straightforward instrument, most probably made of wood, of metal, of copper. It looks straight. So we have depictions of that instrument. When we see figures holding that instrument, we know it's a trumpet. We know it because to the brass category, as we say, right, we say today. However, uh, we know how it's played. It has no sound holes, so it uses the harmonic scale. We tried to make a general list. We know the instruments. We know it from depictions, from late Roman depictions, from late antiquity descriptions, how the instrument looks. Uh, we didn't try to go too back in time so as to read ancient Greek uh, theoretical works. But uh, the instruments are generally found inside the Mediterranean area. The same instrument we will see in uh, Southern Africa, we will see in Turkey, we will see in Persia, we will see in Iran, more or less the same type. Uh, if we take out the Byzantine pipe organ, which is said to be derived from the Idrablis, most of the instruments are found uh, in all parts of the Byzantine empire or further, much, much further away. So we can say that the flute, uh, the avlos, the, the trumpet, the kochlos, the lyre, the psaltery, the cymbals are of Byzantine origin. There are instruments that found their way into Byzantine culture, to Byzantine civilization, through the correspondence with other countries, other states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can see overlaps between the cultures and instruments as well. Huh? So uh, thank you very much, Antonis. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Alexandros about the rhythm part of the project, uh, although as library we overtake <laughs> the uh, some technical uh, aspects of the project, uh, rhythm uh, aspect, but uh, maybe you can mention a little bit uh, how uh, you came up with this idea. It was, I guess, your idea. Uh, can you uh, talk yes, about yes. it? Uh, first of all, it's probably it's the first ever talk at Anamed where three musicologists are at the panel. I don't know how people at the Anamed feel about it. They should feel good. We're not that bad. So uh, three musicologists on the panel. And um, reading came up uh, as, a, as a, a side part of the project. It was not uh, there in the beginning. We didn't think of uh, discussing about that in the beginning because it just came up. And it came up, of course, because the people at Bridim, uh, Professor Antonio Baltasari, was interested in the in the uh, database when uh, this was launched. Um, uh, for those who are not familiar with, uh, and probably quite a few people here would not be familiar with Bridim, is um, I'm just going to very briefly say that is one of the four R projects 
rhythm, 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 and rhythm. In the musicology world, they are, I do not know what the equivalent is in the, in the Byzantinology world, there should be. It's the, the, the basic database uh, uh, platforms uh, for information of any aspect of musicology. Um, and the rhythm is the one uh, that deals with iconography, musical iconography. So uh, nicely enough, uh, also rhythm has been funded by the Stavros Yarkos Foundation, like Gabam has done. Uh, so this was another nice point of touch. Um, so the, we're in the process of um, establishing a connection, a linked data connection between um, the, the database as it exists right now. And it also will appear on, on, on Redim because basically people who might be interested in this project will not know, uh, because they are musicologists, they will not know um, that they can find something like that in, in, uh, in our database. So it's another point where um, the, the, the database will be visible, Redim. Redim has a, co a vast collection of metadata and uh, linked data on other collections around the world that deal with musical iconography. And that's how we came up with the idea of linking the two, uh, the, the, the two platforms and the two organizations. Um, so um, the, the, the information will be there and people will be interested from the musicology world, not the Byzantine world, world right now, uh, will be linked and they will be taken uh, up to, um, uh, um, to, to the Sunakirac library and their digital collection of the uh, Byzantine musical instruments project. So that was the idea how it came up. Thank you very much. Uh, and also I'd like to add uh, something about this. Uh, I think uh, digital collections uh, should not be left to uh, sites. Uh, I mean, they, you need to uh, uh, find new projects, new ideas to uh, keep it alive. Otherwise they will not survive. So uh, such uh, integrations and harvestings are so important uh, exhibitions uh, on European as well. So I find it very successful project management uh, in this respect. Uh, uh, that's the success of this project, uh, I guess. So um, would you like to add more to uh, otherwise, we'll jump to the Q&A section. Can I, can I just say one thing? Uh, of before, course. Because yeah. oh, I see many questions mounting and I don't want to take much time and I don't want to do it in the end. I just want to say it now. Um, mm -hmm. I, I need to thank a few people and I will do it now so that um, uh, this is goes on record. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to, to, to thank Meli Fereli, a very good friend of mine, uh, mm -hmm. who introduced me to Professor Engin Akurek, and we managed to materialize this project. This would never have happened. Also, thank you very much to the people at the Sunakirats Library, and Turba, uh, and uh, Senem, and Sina, and everyone who worked with us, with my colleagues here in Athens, Vera Kriyazi and Yorgos Bubus, who helped, uh, and also the people at Gabam. It was a great, great, great cooperation. And I really looking forward to cooperate more on other projects. So sorry for doing that in the middle, but be because I see those amazing questions here and probably will not have time later, I'm doing it now. So thank you everyone very much. Uh, we thank you uh, on behalf of Sunaklach Library and Coach University. So um, maybe we should skip to the questions. Uh, first, uh, do you know where uh, were the instruments made? Uh, any known workshops, centers? How were the instruments kept in boxes, uh, where in pala palaces, churches? So this question is uh, relevant to the actual uh, 
physical objects, I guess, not the iconography. So maybe we can uh, answer these questions with our knowledge. Uh, where were the instruments made? Uh, most probably the instruments uh, didn't have a specific place of manufacture. I mean, uh, the flute, making the flute, making the lira, making any kind of instrument was already known. The technology behind that was already known. Uh, I have not come with any known workshop. Uh, I mean, the artifacts, uh, we tried to locate the uh, place of origin. Uh, if we see horns in Istanbul, in Constantinople, then most probably the same place would have uh, manufacturers of making the horn. Uh, so, yes, we know on some occasions the provenance, but we don't, uh, are not aware of any workshop or any centers. But I think that this uh, technology, the manufacture process was probably passed through all our tradition and they knew how to make these type of instruments. So were the male musicians dominant or uh, as in the Syrian mosaic, uh, there were equal, equally female musicians, but about composers? Mm -hmm. In the majority of our uh, occasions or of our examples, we see male figures. However, in late antiquity, we are well aware that women uh, were the mimes, the pantomimes. We know that they too took part. We have the Alexander case, the Alexander Romans case, where we see a woman playing and harps, uh, harp. Uh, so yes, uh, in the majority of the cases, men are playing music. However, on occasions like wedding feasts or uh, daily life, we also see women playing musical instruments. On coronation and on example of imperial practice, we only see men I think uh, that is the case. How about composers? Uh, the main problem with Byzantine secular music is the complete lack of any musical scores of that period. We are well, well aware of Byzantine music as in religious practice. We have the manuscript, we know our composers. However, due to the fact that Byzantine secular music was performed mostly inside the Grand Palace during coronations or marriage or birth of an, an emperor or something. Uh, the musical pieces are mentioned in certain historical text. They say, for instance, where during the great paralysis, that is the emperor coming to the throne, we will execute a musical piece on the scale of like a fourth mode, that is the rust mode uh, in Turkish Makam. So, yes, we know what it is supposed to be played. We know the instruments that participated, but we have no uh, written proof of the music itself. We can only speculate what it sounded like. Uh, the first musical pieces that we come across in Byzantine notation uh, are from uh, the late, from the middle of the 16th century. So we, yeah. don't know, we don't know what happened in the centuries before that. Yeah, I guess uh, as practitioners, the um, professionalism in uh, females, among females, is a uh, pretty modern idea, I guess. Even in Europe, like uh, after the 19th century, it started. And uh, I guess that in uh, old Greece and uh, Byzantine, culture also, uh, it was something for entertainment purposes uh, for women, I guess. So what do you think? Not Alexandros? <laughs> no, 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 go, go on. Oh, okay. That, that followed the late antiquity tradition of uh, women participating uh, in uh, festive occasions. Uh, you're right that generally speaking, uh, women either in uh, Western Europe uh, history were not so many. For example, we know of Kazulan and the mother girls in the 13th century. We know that everyone before her and after her were mostly men, men composers, men artists. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I don't know, Alexander, would you like to say anything? Yeah, but I, I believe totally the same. Then, I mean, even composers, women composers, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phenomenon actually of the 19th century onwards, in a sense. I mean, from the all the traditions we have like people like 
Hildegard von Bingen, but that's one mm -hmm. occasion that we know. Uh, yes, so we should never, never forget that all this music and um, it's it fall it, it it falls into a processional understanding of the thing. So composers were not that important to know. Maybe in a sense, I don't know. I don't want to sound very uh, uh, radical if I say that, but the, the, the composers were not really considered artists in the in the in the in the in the you know sole purpose of the word in that sense. They were doing a job that didn't need reference art. They were not creating artifacts in that sense all the time. Um, and this is this is a well-known fact. Um, I mean, it's uh, it, it took time in order to become part of the of the of the artistic world for mm -hmm. for composers. Thank you. So all of the images collected in the database, what percentage is comprised of images of David? So can we give a percentage or uh, have you come across ma many David uh, images? I was ex kind of expecting uh, this um, question. David is mostly found in the Book of Psalms, which take up a great number of our manuscripts. Um, I'm trying to find out right now. Uh, I'm pretty sure there will be a lot of Davids inside. First of all, we see David in the David and Goliath battle. We see musicians uh, celebrating David's victory over Goliath. We see David with the followers of the Ark of the Covenant, with Ethan, the Thum, and other musicians. It's not David alone as the king. We see David uh, uh, coronation. We see David marriage. We see David composing the Psalms. We see David in many instances. So that is a tricky question. From what I can see right now, it, there are more than 100 Davids. Yeah. Uh, then we can say one, one fourth of the collection is made up of David's images. David, David is, related. Yes, David related. Yeah. A better expression. Uh, so also I'd like to add something about that. Uh, when you search by words, you can't find uh, anything on the website as well, database. So for, for your information. So another question is what music and instruments were played for funerals or at, uh, weddings, church feasts, or we can say uh, different instances or occasions. Mm. Uh, mostly where our research is based on two books, uh, the books of ceremony by Constantine Porfirogenitos and the treatise on offices by Pseudocodinos, these two writers, uh, the first in the 10th century and the other one in the 14th century are providing us with plenty of information concerning ceremonial practices, ceremonial music, as to what is played before the wedding, during the wedding, after the wedding, uh, once an imperial guest arrives to the great palace, what music is performed, how it is performed, all the ritual. So mostly they're using instruments that we're well aware of, such as avlos, flutes, we could say, stringed instruments, especially before the wedding and after the wedding. And mostly we must not forget about the Byzantine pipe organ, which was present in the hippodrome when the emperor would arrive, when the emperor would leave, and would be heard the, uh, several times during the day, especially on horse racing day. And uh, the dims, that is the fraction of the people, the blues and the greens that used to acclaim the emperor and had Byzantine pipe organs themselves. So yes, we know the instruments. We, are, we know, for instance, that in the wedding, the night before the wedding, a group of musicians, which comprised of string, uh, players, uh, chordophone players of cymbals and of avlos would arrive at the soon be to be acclaimed Augusta home and would mm -hmm. her by the sound of music. Yet, once again, we don't know the music itself. We are only known of the procedure. Yeah, we can also assume that the by the sound of music, maybe loud uh, instruments might be more suitable for the settings of the ceremonial things like 
maybe military uh, hippodrome, races, uh, war scenes. On the other hand, quiet uh, instruments like string instruments might be more suitable for the chamber settings. Can we say that? Uh, yes, we can say that. We know that trumpets were used for signaling purposes, for military purposes. We mm -hmm. see on the first slide in the coronation uh, scene of Leo V, we have trumpets. Trumpets so as to be heard. We know the Kavaliki of Magwots was when the emperor would go on horseback around the city of Istanbul. And uh, they, we had groups of people playing trumpets so as for ordinary people to be able to hear he is coming there. So yes, we have the loud instruments, which most probably, apart from military purposes, were used in official ceremonies. And we have the low in uh, volume instruments, such as the flute or the psaltery, that would accompany imperial feasts, where the environment would be surely much quieter compared to the outer city. Yeah, we have a question about performance practices. Uh, are we able to gather information on the performance practices as well in the material collected for this project? Maybe detailed descriptions in manuscripts, as you mentioned early on, right? Uh, in the text, you can get detailed descriptions of the performance practices, maybe. Uh, I think you... Uh, responded to this question, but maybe you can add something uh, up to you. Uh, yes, most of the information we can gather come from historical text. Uh, right before we talked about the major, the two major books, the two major historical treatises. Uh, however, there are uh, from, the, we have the Ibn Battuta texts, we have uh, other Greek texts, we have several texts that describe what, what, what was happening in Constantinople during that time. And so, yes, we can compile a list of rituals and the instruments that participated in that, but only that, only to that extent. And we see that the same instruments are played in several occasions in, uh, when an emperor leaves his palace, when another emperor arrives by a boat in the boats, the official ships that arrived to Istanbul, we once have trumpets and cymbals uh, escorting the imperial guests on the imperial per persons, figures. Yes, the historical texts do provide us with many details. And of course, we must also see the manuscript themselves or the images or the frescoes or the mosaics as to what they depict. Many of the time it is of Christian origin, of uh, religious origin, of historical, uh, but many times they have a historical value. We see everyday practice. Uh, I don't know if that would explain. Yes. Would you Thank you very much. So how did you determine uh, the cataloging parameters for the database? And are they prone to change depending on the sustainability search requirements of the users, etc.? I think we we did this uh, in the beginning of the uh, project, right, Alexandros? With uh, maybe Alexandros might uh, answer yeah. this question. Yeah, yeah, yes, the, 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 we determined the the parameters of the database uh, uh, following, like you know, um, uh, sustainable library schemas, li li librarianship schemas that they will. Uh, fit to to the purpose that we wanted. Um, I think that uh, as I mean, uh, Senem, you know it far better than I am. Uh, that uh, the the way that uh, the metadata have been have been formed in the end, uh, they are um, 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 suitable for any kind of. Uh, um, uh, well, you see here, uh, they they are suitable for any type of. Uh, uh, schemas to be adjusted to, uh, and especially with uh, bigger uh, um, um, projects such as Europeana. Um, the, well, if these are going to, to change, I'm not very sure in, the, in what sense they can change and towards what, but if there is any, any suggestion, why not? We can discuss it, but... Yeah, actually, Ivan... Uh, 
Sorry, yeah. uh, go ahead, Mary. Yes. I should intervene. We have made a lot of changes from the database that was in the beginning and the end one. Yeah. And of course. Yeah, yeah. Edit more fields, but mostly we have edited how these fields were filled, exactly. how they are uniform. And for example, the material type here you see on the left is the material type of the database entry, which is image. And type of material here is the actual artifacts type. So these are the things that can be conformed according to your needs, but it's mostly basic museum inventory sheet. Yeah, actually when you harvest with the uh, Europeana or Rhythm, you need to uh, adjust your database schema to their own standards, even though they use the same kind of uh, basic principles. Um, so it happens all the time when you need to uh, integrate your collections. So uh, there's an interpretation. So uh, which instrument is the star piece of the collection, Antonis? <laughs> which one is the star? We have many stars, if I may say so, in our category. Uh, we try to give some statistics in the beginning, like saying that the chordophones, the kithara is the most obvious, uh, obviously sling. In the aerophones is the trumpet, in the idiophones is the cymbals, and in the membrane of phones is the double skin barred drum. The major category is the aerophones and the trumpet is most probably mostly seen. The trumpet can be explained because as we said before, it is used in ceremonies, it is used in, uh, for military purposes, it is used in the Judgment Day, which takes a lot of uh, Christian religious scenes. Um, the trumpet is on the top right part of our slide. So that is why most probably the trumpet is most of the time seen there. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, another question is, uh, my question is, what was the most demanding part of the project? Collecting the images, clearing the IPR? or something else. I told my part, so maybe you can tell your own uh, take about that. What was the most challenging part? Alexandros. I think that one of the most challenging parts is to uh, finish this project uh, amidst this situation that we're facing with COVID because we had we needed to do a lot of coordination. We were supposed to be a few more meetings, you know, face to face in order to be able to, to, to go forward. Uh, but we managed on time. So um, that was quite challenging, I think. Uh, and we managed. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very happy about it. Now, of course, Adonis will say it was very difficult to find X, Y, Z miniature. And they were mm -hmm. not uh, letting me into that X, Y, Z um archive uh, but likely enough we're done before covid came in came uh, came upon us so mm -hmm. that was that was that was um, i mean that was a good coincidence let's say not not covid of course we have finished the research part but he has finished the research part yeah we were planning some events here uh, in turkey istanbul about uh, uh, promotion also uh, Athens. also Athens. yeah uh, this will happen, this will happen. Yes. It will so, go away, it will happen. Hopefully. Uh, how about Antonis? So you work like a detective, uh, right? Uh, yes. Uh, luckily, we had uh, Professor Malara's book to start with. We had about 200 images there, which were mixed between Greek and Latin origin. Uh, this was the beginning bibliographical reference on which the research was based. And afterwards, we continued reading more and more, more books. Uh, I must say that Koch University has an, a great library. Anamit has many books. Both of you have seen me there quite a few times, trying to investigate through your archives. Uh, the, this was one of the most difficult part I mean, uh, updating the current bibliographical references, trying to validate its result, trying to see if the century is correct, trying to see if the museum is correct, 
trying to see if the inventory number is correct. Uh, the Top Kapi Museum Library, uh, it was a privilege that I had the chance to go inside and check all 19 manuscripts that are there, one by one. Uh, the Patriarchate of uh, Constantinople, I went there, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there are more than 300 manuscripts, uh, not cataloging uh, in detail, so we have to take out one by one from the shelf. That took two months, if I recall correctly. It was difficult, but at the same time, it was rejuvenating. It gave me more strength to carry on. And once you see that what you are doing has a purpose and will serve the some other people, some other researchers or musicology or anyone else interested in this type of things, uh, it gives you an extra strength to go up this extra mile. Uh, Alexandros is right. Yes, we have great difficulty in communicating with all the institutes, many of which we have to go over three, four times in a row, every mail, every week, to get some result. And the good thing that due to our common effort, this project was finished a semester earlier than it was supposed to finish. I arrived in, in Istanbul late October, and if I remember, in, in the beginning of May, June, the previous year, it was already finished. So we went ahead of ourselves, and this can only be interpreted as a common effort. We had a great communication, me with Gabam, uh, Professor Engin, uh, Merve, Boris, who is now in Germany, with the Friends of Music Society, Alexandros, uh, Vera, Yorgos, uh, Stephanie, with USNM, and everyone involved with Vasya in Anamed, that gave me free access to go inside and study. So yes, my part of thanking everyone, I guess it's this time. Uh, this is a common effort, a common work. Yeah, thanks. So, Marve? <laughs> <laughs> the most difficult part <clears throat> is always is always homogenizing, recategorizing that is actually done in a different way. And while translating, this gives you another chance to get more involved with the material. And I think it turned out nice and it turned out as a base for further research. And hopefully we will be able to extend it in another way in the future. So thank you. Uh, so maybe the institutions might be more open to academic researchers to share their resources, primary resources, because in the end, they are not done. Uh, this kind of uh, work is not done for the commercial purposes, we don't sell anything, but we just uh, give information. Uh, in the end, their uh, holdings are also represented in the databases. So I think they could have been more open to uh, sharing their resources. So another question, what about the influence of Arabic instruments and music? So uh, where is the influence of dominance or rejection? I guess uh, maybe I can't uh, ask this question in that way. Arabic influence in Byzantine, maybe ma uh, makam can be, but not Arabic. I think uh, also in Turkish makams, we see some parallels with Byzantine music, right? Mm -hmm. uh... Regarding the Arabic instruments, as I said earlier, the same instruments are met, are encountered in all the Mediterranean. However, on one manuscript on the Alexander Romans, which is kept in the Institute of Byzantine, Post Byzantine Studies in Venice, we encounter a membranophone, which is not encountered elsewhere, it's the Nakers or Nakara, as it is wrong. Mm -hmm. So that shows that the artist who made this manuscript knew about the musical instruments of other nations or Arabic nations, for instance. Uh, I cannot, however, speak again about the music. 
the music is something completely different. We can only make speculations about the instruments. Some of them are encountered elsewhere. So this is all I can say about the influence of Arabic instruments. We can see instruments that are seen elsewhere. We know instruments that come from Western Europe, like the buizin that looks like uh, the trumpet, but not actually like that. We see that uh, the Byzantine Empire most probably was a place for evolution, for cultural evolution. We see that they made some instruments, they evolved some others, and they were open to any kind of relationship, to cultural relationship between themselves and all the others. So another question is about the exclusion of uh, instruments from the religious uh, music. So while compiling the material, did you have any insights on the van and why of the inclusion of instruments from the Byzantine Christian wor worship? Was there ever uh, a time when the musical instruments were seen or used in the church? Uh, if I recall correctly, I have no nowhere seen a musical instrument inside the church contrary to the catholic uh, way of doing the religious service the byzantines never used a musical instruments inside the church mainly because they thought that this would turn out they will uh, reduce the strength of the praise towards the lord by hearing music that's why we only have chanters and not musical ensembles inside our churches. Uh, we have musical instruments inside churches, but only when uh, these churches belong to the Venetians, for instance, on the 14th to 16th century. Uh, Greek churches that were occupied by the Venetians here in Crete or in other places in Greece. No, I, can, I have not seen any instrument inside the church, uh, yet we are known that they exist on a very small numbers and a very small percentage. For instance, in the Prince Islands, we know from historical texts that on late 17th century, far beyond the Byzantine Empire centuries uh, period, we have musicians that play music to celebrate Easter and not inside the church, but on the narthex outside. So mm -hmm. it's not a common practice. We never had uh, musical instruments inside the church is during religious uh, scenes. Mm -hmm. So could you perhaps elaborate more on the thesaurus of organological terminology used for the database? Uh, is it primarily technical, ethnomusicological, historical, or both? Uh, if you would like to say something, uh, Senem, would you like to? No, no, please go ahead. Uh, it is Primarily a technical uh, thesaurus. It, it, we tried to keep a plain uh, approach towards the instrument. Uh, it's not so technical. It's a generally idea, giving a general idea to the public of how the instrument is is uh, made, what it is made from, if we encounter it in uh, ancient or older civilizations, and just that. It's not a, a very detailed. Uh, description of the instruments because this would get many historical problems and perhaps inconsistencies and we would, wouldn't like that because the artifacts and the depictions do not clearly demonstrate what the instrument is all about how it is made or as i said before how many sound holes it has how many string it features and so on mm -hmm. so we have it I'm, I'm sorry i'm sorry Sanem. Uh, i will just want to say that if you go towards uh, an ethnomusicological, let's say, path, you need to make too many assumptions. Am I right, Adonis? Uh, you need to go towards a, a time where you know you don't you do not have, unfortunately, the actual instrument. So you need to make assumptions about things. Um, so that's why the, the, the your research was uh, was going towards the the more technical uh, aspect of the of the of the of the. Um, of the instrument. Mm, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a complicated question. I can't pronounce it. Knedetika of Sedo Ophian manuscripts, 23rd uh, 
Recto at uh, Marciano Library has several hard to identify objects. Some researchers argued several might be Greek fire hand uh, siphons of the of a certain type. I'm having a hard time determining whether they are wind instruments or weapons. Uh, I haven't found it uh, on Gabam yet, uh, but I just started searching them. Uh, I'd like to thank you and congratulate all the researchers. Um, so what would you say about that, Antonis? So do you have any uh, information about? Yes, I do. Uh, mm -hmm. If you just give me one second. Kinegetika of Sidobian Manuscript 23 Recto. Sorry about the small delay. Uh, uh, are we referring to the sea battle, most probably, the one that says Navmahia? Uh, the handing of opium uh, can be found in two manuscripts, the Marciana Library Grecus 479 and the Paris Janus Grecus 2736. Uh, the same illuminations repeat themselves on both occasions. They are almost identical. So in this occasion, the writer, the painter, writes Navmahia, which means sea battle. And we see people on both boats uh, holding these long pipes and close to their mouth. So perhaps it was uh, the issue again of trumpets on top of boats that are served as a military purpose. I don't know if that is the question. Yes, but in my opinion, they are wind instruments and most probably trumpets. They are not horse because they're straight in shape and we can encounter those exact uh, instruments in other occasions as well, the exact shape. Mm -hmm. We have a question about the lira, um, not the lira or other instruments, but we more the terminological usage of instrument names. So uh, by Turks and Greek people, uh, maybe we call an instrument by uh, several names. That's why the same instruments uh, can be called by different names. That's why we assume that uh, the instruments are not the same. Um, maybe without any ideological view, have we really a real source of uh, organology? Um, I'm a little confused here. <laughs> of course, there are sources, but the etymology of the same instruments can change into uh, countries, maybe, or in <laughs> to uh, cultures. That's uh, the question maybe it depends on the interpretation i guess right interpretation of the uh, local people or cultures mm -hmm. uh, it, this question is very difficult to respond to because yes as you said before you're right about the same instrument with different names and countries in both civilizations Yes, we have the bagpipe, which is called Tulum. We have the same names that uh, do respond to the same instruments. Uh, I cannot either understand the question. Uh, we, cannot make we cannot make speculation about the origins. We cannot be sure as to who and where did what or at what time period this happened. I don't know, Senem, if you would like to say something as a new musicologist yourself, uh, or Alexandros. Um. I think uh, the question might be about the uh, um, ethnocentric viewpoint of uh, determining or uh, identifying objects uh, in music. Uh, maybe it has some kind of ideological aspects that might be the interpretation it's not actually a question i guess what do you say alexandros i think that um by, by looking at the question probably it means for instance a tambour who invented it first this kind of it is such a such a type of question mm -hmm. actually yeah it, whenever i'm not an, a, a big expert in organology uh to be honest uh but Whenever one goes down this this discussion, then you know it might end up you know saying, "Oh yes, the first one was in Scotland. Nothing to do with here, and someone brought it. That's it." You know, and uh, I think that 
this this area of the world has been a melting pot for too much, and uh, it's very difficult to trace back and get the first origin of someone who you know made a tulum or a bagpipe or a guide or whatever you want to call this kind of instrument and find where the original source. So it might actually you know come really come from that far as I was saying like you know Scotland. Anyway, it's, I think that it, it is very difficult to do. This is more than a detective work. It goes beyond that. And I think that we need to just admit to ourselves that we have been exchanging, all the people who live in this area of the world, they have been exchanging culture, music, mm -hmm. everything, all this time in, in this world uh, of the centuries and centuries. So we need to admit that everyone, uh, anything is everyone's and everyone is anything. So we need to go from there and then just acknowledge art and all this music and all this in great stuff that, we, that these people who live in this area of the world managed to accomplish all these years. Yeah, I agree. Also the folk music tunes are the same. Uh, only the words are different. Yes, Greek and the, or the Turkish. stories are the same, you know? Even the, the stories are the same, the myths. Yep. Where, where they're built upon and then suddenly you just realize, oh, okay, there's a Bulgarian song which is like that and you didn't know about it and then you go on and go on. That's it. It's We need to admit it to ourselves. Whoever goes back and starts finding will find a lot and it will be the same. Yeah, I guess the making that kind of uh, clear-cut distinction between the cultures and uh, cultural elements is kind of artificial uh, thing to do just works for the separation actually they are all blended to my mind yeah exactly it's like trying to find the origins of violin is it western european is it arabic is it persian did it comes from viola da gamba does it come from pythagoras monochord does it come from the Assyrians? who is invented it first it's very difficult we have instruments that are continuously evolving to something else, but it's very difficult to get back to the initial step, the initial phase. Mm -hmm. That's why, as Yusenem and Alexandros stated, yes, all the Mediterranean countries share the same civilization, the same uh, sound, the same music, the same rhythm, the same scales, the same, almost everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we don't have any more questions. Uh, before closing, maybe I have one more uh, questions to answer. Uh, we will uh, broadcast this uh, program uh, on YouTube, uh, Anime Talks channel, as well as SoundCloud. Uh, you can access there um, after the uh, Zoom. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, maybe I can leave this uh, Vasilya. Thank you. I thank you all. Uh, Adoni, Alexandre, Merpes, and Nem for being part of the Anime Talks and uh, for your presentation today. It is very important for researchers to have access um, to such a rare collection and it's important to share this project with a wider audience. I'm very impressed, not only with the content itself, but also with the teamwork and the effort uh, you have all invested on it. And I'm also very happy uh, that Greeks participate in it. Uh, as Enem said, we will uh, include the sound recording on our SoundCloud account and the video on uh, the Animate Library YouTube channel. It, uh, they will be available the following days. Uh, as for the Animate Library talks, they will continue in May, uh, in specific in May 4, with Misa Semis from the Department of Architecture at Abdullah Gil University and her uh, publication, Dimitriadis Effendinin, uh, Marmara Sahil, Surlari Panoramase. Good evening to all.